Hi everyone, welcome to eLearn Chat, where you always, and I mean always, usually for the most part, learn something new. And we're going to learn something new today. I am sure you could see who our co-host is today. She's been on many times, Lisa Goldstein. Lisa, how are you? Great, Rick. Thanks for having me back. I really oh, appreciate it. So nice to be here with you. Always a pleasure. And, uh, and we've got a guest. She's one of your co-workers. Yes, Rebecca. Rebecca Withers. She's absolutely phenomenal. I can't wait for you to meet her. We were talking a little bit pre-show, and she's talented. She does voices. She does absolutely. all sorts of things. So we'll see what we can get out of her today. Um, anyway, here we go. And we are back and joining us in, uh, there she is in the center position of power. It's Rebecca. Hello. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Rick. How are you? We're good. And both of you uh, in your lower third say work for uh, Nielsen, Nielsen Ratings. So mm -hmm. welcome to the show. You guys have been uh, co-workers for a couple of years already. So this is, this is good. What did you folks want to talk about today? So uh, I think we just want to share with you some of our exciting things that we've been accomplishing lately. Um, Nielsen has um, quite a few learning teams, and um, I think we even have a, we brought some pictures with us so that you can see some of the people from our team. But we work with um, oh, wow. a bunch of just really talented, wonderful people doing absolutely fabulous things. And uh, maybe we'll explain that kitchen shot here a little bit later in the chat. But um, so many talented people working underneath human resources and operations, and we have a client-facing group as well, and um, really just putting out some really phenomenal, innovative, uh, and quality work. And um, wanted to bring Rebecca along today because she is so phenomenal, so um, talented. And if you show the next picture, you can even see Rebecca. Um, doing some of her voiceover work. Rebecca is absolutely phenomenal, like you were mentioning, Rick, just a minute ago. And uh, Rebecca can tell you more about some of the ways that she has incorporated some of her really fabulous voice art in a lot of our learning programs. So, um, Rebecca, tell us more about, um, you know, what you enjoy doing. Why do, why do you enjoy doing it? And, um, and uh, what, what have you been using it for lately? Definitely. So I am very passionate about all levels of design, but audio design is really unique and gives you an opportunity to give life and rejuvenate some really interesting learning opportunities. So in that picture, I was recording a script for a game that we built, and it was a detective-based game. So I was the character, your partner, going through the investigation and seeking out some really interesting evidence. And in order to get your learners in the mood of that tone, you need to be able to give that character both the you know respectful tone of adult learning while still having the energy and vibrance. And you can see that character in the lower corner. Um, the audio lines would jump around as my voice and the character. And um, that's the picture in the bottom left corner here. And uh, just being able to do that really gave life to the exploration and allowed to the learner to be able to explore the city and never feel lost and always feel connected to what they were learning. And so I'm really passionate about being able to bring that into that world and give it that life. Now let me ask you something. And, this, and is, this is something we always hear and see it's that it's that balancing act between good e-learning, having fun, and what operations want, which is quick, dirty, get it out there and don't bother us. How do you, how do you wind up getting that balance where you can get the budget and you can have the fun? Because that's always something that a lot of companies struggle with, um, not the e-learning departments per se, but the companies who don't want to do it. Because um, not everybody gets yeah, to have that much fun. And, and I think it's really important to call out that it's not a one-size-fits-all. To your point, Rick, we have to really identify with each project um, which of these things can afford, uh, you know, a little extra investment because it should have that investment mm -hmm. versus the things that w really need the speed to market. If they really need, you know, information out there quickly, um, you know, there's lots of ways that we can 
meet that need and get information to them fast through performance support type materials. Right. Um, but when there's some investment needed of needing a memorable story, um, you know, we find that um, if one needs to memorize the information and memorize mm -hmm. uh, what to do in different kinds of cases, that's where that additional investment is really important. Because if you don't need to memorize something, sort of like your numbers in your phone, you know, then you just need some quick support material so that you can get that answer quickly and get right back to work. But if it's something that you really need to invest some time into that muscle memory, mm -hmm. then it's important to have some things that stick. And in this particular case, what I really liked about what Rebecca created here, not only is she a phenomenal voiceover artist, but the content that she created was memorable and it had uh, the elements of making you want to complete the information because of all the rewards that came out of that gamification experience, the collection of the various pieces of information and being well rewarded you know, when you did collect those pieces and were able to prove understanding of the different elements. And because of the storified elements built into it, uh, we found that the knowledge stuck better uh, and uh, really worked well in this particular scenario where they needed that muscle memory. Well, one thing Rebecca said, which I totally 1 million percent agree with, is the audioscape of a course or of anything because people don't put enough emphasis on audio whether it's voices whether it's music sound effects anything they just don't and it's a shame because that reinforces the memory probably more than anything uh more often than not i mean you could have images they're great but you turn off the audio on an image and people don't remember the images they remember the audio so it's just a, an interesting thing what got you into audio design rebecca I have grown up in multiple formats where I got to play with audio, mostly with music and musical theater and acting. And after college, I got into radio and I was a radio uh -huh. producer and co-host for a really great talk show that was, it just covered so many really exciting events, local and national. And I was able to bring that vibrance through and learn all about making really clear, concise audio and really clear, concise scripting. And I wanted to bring that into an adult learning world. And I wanted to bring those skills into creating really memorable content and that content that makes a real impact in someone's life. And I felt that this was the perfect opportunity for me. And picking, picking, picking back off of what you said earlier, excuse me, um, about how you make the time for this kind of, kind of investment in what you're creating. I think that also takes really strong leadership and someone who can come in and say, okay, so we have this really great team with all these really great diverse skills mm -hmm. and how can we divide and conquer in a way that allows us to get this done on such an aggressive timeline. And I think that's really where Lisa came in and having that voice on our behalf and having that strong consultation up front allowed us to really be able to excel in each of our unique skill sets. So I think it's like she said, it's, it's, it's teamwork. It's working together and bringing all those great attributes together in a really cohesive team culture. Rebecca, it's too kind. I, I'll uh, <laughs> I'll pay you later for the nice comments. <laughs> it's true. Um, so, <laughs> thank you. So, I, I think we've had so much fun with uh, you know what what we've been doing, Rick. Um, we've um, you know before we leave the gamification topic and and talk about some of the other things that we've been doing to take care of modern learners. Um, we also took um, a different twist. We we piloted a different kind of game where there was instead of just the the one on one the one on e learning type of gamification so there's uh, a competition really against yourself we also did one on one type gaming where individuals were able to challenge coworkers mm -hmm. on various pieces of knowledge and it's the classic type of multiple choice but it's timed so the faster you answer questions the more points you get and okay. when you're challenging colleagues and you have um, 
there's a large bank of questions, but some of the questions repeat, which is good for, you know, again, that retention and muscle memory. Um, but, uh, but we did a small pilot, so we only had about 230, 250 participants. And, but when they uh, were playing, we found that they uh, wanted to repeat the games over and over because there was a higher sense of competition. When they didn't win, they wanted to re-challenge and we found that the feedback about this was so exciting because it drove them to want to learn something more than once and better ingraining that information. And uh, they found it really exciting and, and um, they've definitely been asking for more. And, and people so like to really compete. And people like to compete. They yeah. don't want to wipe each other out, but they like to compete. And, and, and a lot of places just <laughs> say, competition. no competition, no competition. Competition's bad. <laughs> Why? Competition's good. Um, yeah. it, it's, it's funny. We, we've had, um, we had one, um, she was a, a writer, instructional designer years ago. And, and we were talking about some football game that happened, like, I don't know, the day before. And one team really trounced another. And she goes, that's so unfair. And we went, no, it is. And it was fun. And they're like, and, and there was several of us who all agreed it was fun watching him get trounced. And she was like, no, it's, it's evil. It's wrong. It's mean. And we go, it's a game. They're having fun. They're, the losing team's not having a lot of fun, but the winning team was having a good And it doesn't happen every day. So what's the problem? So we, it was interesting, the, the mindset of, and she was a recent grad too. Uh, this is about five, five years ago, maybe. And she just couldn't understand the competition part of it. I go, we're not hurting each other. It, nobody's getting hurt in the game, but it's a good competition. Whether you win or lose, you're still learning from it. Right. And, and in this case, I think that even though it's a one-on-one -on -one competition, mm -hmm. it's still seen as a team sport. It's seen right. as, it's recognized that this is learning. And the, and the better we learn together, the more, the more we know together, you know, the better we're going to perform together. So it's yep. still a team sport. That's true. Now, how often do so, you take advantage of voiceover on, on your training? Do you always add voiceover? Do you not? Um, pretty frequently. Um, it's in our e-learning uh, content, of course, um, that we do have some performance mm -hmm. support type of materials that we yeah. do. But we have been getting into more micro-learning, which means... Uh, you know, more video, um, more, you know, short bits of information. But yes, sure. we incorporate <laughs> the voiceovers and those bits also. Yeah. A lot of people think voiceover adds a lot of expense to it. It doesn't really. It doesn't have to. Um, you know, the only thing that's bad it, sometimes is voices change. You may have a voiceover mm -hmm. talent you used on a big piece, and all of a sudden they're not available for two years. It's like, uh-oh. And then you have to either find a new voiceover or just add a different voice into it in a different way. But that's the only negative we've ever found is that sometimes the VO talent we've used wasn't available. It's rare, but it could happen. Uh, or they got sick. That, that happened to us once. Yeah, you know. Well, and you saw in a previous picture that we, you know, we have a large size team. It's not mm -hmm. just Rebecca and I. Right. And we have found that there really hasn't been a, a huge amount of diversity to, or uh, uh, adversity, I should say, to um, having diverse voices. Unless, of course, if you need to fix a singular line and suddenly right. you've got one awkward, you know, sentence, you know, using somebody else's voices. But if, you know, from module to module, you know, there really isn't a problem we find um, using different people across the team. And we have actually such a really lovely, diverse uh, set of voices on our team. We have Jeff Lucas, who uh, is actually a performance artist. Uh, hmm. You know, he's been uh, in some mini type of Broadway type plays. And so he's brought a lot of character. Also, we have uh, Mike Anderson, who definitely sounds like a, a radio personality. So he's been perfect for us and Nancy Bacon and others who do phenomenal work. So I think that, um, yeah, the different voices seem to work out okay within That's great. our team and you our audience. You can use that to your advantage too. There's no mm -hmm. saying that that has to be a disadvantage because when you have a lot of learning content, sometimes it's good to break it up to say, here's the voice that's going to introduce some of the complex concepts we're going to cover. And here's the voice that's going to walk you through some of the games in, involved and in allowing you to be engaged. So it's okay to have those diverse voices even between modules because it helps break up the content in your mind, make that schema of information a little more manageable that's true yeah and, and, actually, and, and bringing oh god no i was just going to say Sorry, you right? have you have one rare thing that a lot of people in-house 
for example, don't have in a lot of corporations, and that is that kind of talent. That's not normally found in most training or e-learning departments where you've got people with that, with the, let's say, the performance abilities or anything else. So that's cool. That's actually a, a real benefit that's not seen all that often. Yeah, w w while we see that uh, we do have people on the team who have their specialty of what they are extra passionate about, mm -hmm. for the most part, we encourage a well-roundedness um, because we really care about the constant development of everyone on the team. And um, I, I think it's best when people are exposed and can grow in all directions within the learning space. So everyone's pretty well-rounded on the team and, and is capable of, if they had to, you know, go off and run even a, a singular one-person e-learning team because they are so well-rounded. And, and I'd love to bring it right back to storytelling because um, you know, when, you know, you have these different voices and you can do more with story, I think it ha it's really impactful. And Rebecca, you've done so much with storytelling um, over the last year. You really incorporated into it. And I think that you've got some good passions around why this is extra important. Yeah, having this story-driven learning experience was exceptionally important, important in this particular example because they had this disconnect between the work they were doing and the audience they had to communicate on a day-to-day -day job. They were phone representatives for these panelists mm -hmm. and they, you know, were running into really important issues where, you know, there was a new adopted child in the family, which was the first thumbnail, or there was maybe an older gentleman that didn't fully understand how to use this web application that they had. And so it was about connecting the employees to these real people and these real stories and showing the impact that they had by allowing to learn more about how they were providing this customer service in this way. And it doesn't always have to be some crazy detective story or some fun, super wild character voice. It can be as simple as, you know, this is what you experience day to day, and this is how you can make that better, and walking them through that. Yeah, and, and Rick, I think it's really exciting, all the things that's happening on this team. Um, I think that not only is this team really good at content creation, I think this team is really good at focusing on the needs of the modern learner um, because we recognize and look for um, those places where there's opportunity to provide a better user experience. And one of the fabulous things to be said about Nielsen is that we drown our people in resources. They are well taken care of uh, to the point where it becomes such a mountain um, and when you have a large employee population like Nielsen with 40,000 employees and you, so you have this mountain of needs and uh, you know the mountain of resources, sometimes it can be difficult to um, find that gem and when, it, it, when you search, it's kind of like Google, you get you know 30 different kinds of results on a singular topic and you want to make sure that the one in the list of 30 that you think is is right for you truly is right because how many times have you gone through an e-learning program and said oh this isn't what i expected it to be i'm not getting out of it what i thought i was going to get out of it so um we started making trailers so um mm. and and this has been a really big hit and i think we even have a picture of that one too um to show show you what it looks like inside of our system um but we um made these two to three minute trailers that tell you what to expect, but give, sell you that with them. You know, what's in it for me? Why does this yep. matter? What's, the, what's yep. the problem that we're trying to solve here? Uh, what specifically are you gonna, you know, help me to be successful at as an individual who goes through this program? But it also functions as micro learning because a lot of our topics are things that it, people need different bits out of. Sometimes they just want the two minute story. They don't have time or nor are interested in the 20 to 30 minute detail. So watching these videos also function um, like a micro learning and you get what you need out of it at a high level. And then it helps you to decide whether or not <coughs> um, it's the right fit for you to go through the whole program. That's actually a good idea about the trailers. I like that. It, it, you could have a lot of fun with that too, you know, using movie themes or whatever else. That, that would be fun. Yeah, we, we have another one that we the learner to that 
that overarching, if, especially if it's a learning path, you know, how, how far into it do I need to go or how, how does this going to relate to my personal job or my personal experience at Nielsen? And this is a quick snapshot into that where they don't have to, you know, get halfway through the learning and wonder, you know, where their learning path is going to end up. So it allows them a quick insight and also gets them really excited about what they're going to learn and allows, you know, again, with voiceover and graphic design, you can really bring that forward in a really easy, quick way like these trailers. Yeah, and a lot of people think that it's super expensive to do something nice, and it isn't. It, it really isn't. No, you don't have all. to spend a fortune. We did we did an immersion piece one time. It was at an uh, back then ASTD technology show, and it took us like two days to build this thing. And it was just uh, you went from room to room to room to room, and you were clicking on things. Everything was active. It was kind of like the old just grandma and me game. We everything is available to you, and that was seen by one company which hired another company to hire us it was just weird how the way that worked out but it's interesting because they kept saying we don't have graphic artists to do this i go we used a graphic artist three hours on this piece and they go that's it yeah we took pictures and we bought stock from my stock and that was the rooms and then we did a little bit of color correction on the rooms and then we did some other stuff and the rest is just really click boxes. You click here, that navigates you there. You click there, maybe a voice comes up. You click there, elevator door is open. Nothing was that difficult. And they kept going, well, how much did that cost? I go, well, if you had to put a price on it, probably, I don't know, a couple grand. And and because we had voice, so we, we did add some voice over to it. And that was it. And everybody thought that took months and months. It was like, oh gosh no we did that in two days and really if you have a cell phone we would i'd say here's your camera if you have no cameras you have no gear no equipment here's your camera right here take something go into go around your office and Absolutely. make rooms and and you can have a lot of fun with that without a lot of thing now i i am a geek at heart so i have to ask you this um <laughs> what what um mic do you like to use Oh, my favorite microphone right now is the Harlan Hogan. I keep it so close to my heart. It's my favorite voiceover mic. If you have a quick recording you need to just get done very quickly and the audio doesn't need to be at, you know, competitive level, uh, my second favorite mic would be either the Yeti or the Snowball. I think uh -huh. those are really yep. easy to use USB microphones. But if you have time to sit down in an audio booth like we've built for our team, the Harlan Hogan, and I plug that into a mixer, which connects to my computer, and mm -hmm. it, it creates such beautiful sound. It's such a great microphone to have. That's good. <clears throat> That's good. The mics are fun. Rick, I, I, Rick, I love your skills as a show host. You knew exactly what to ask Rebecca, and, and I don't know if you saw how big her face brightened up. You're like, <laughs> oh, you asked me the perfect question. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, I go to sleep with my microphone, so. <laughs> yes, you get me. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we have a, we have a lot of mics in here, so when it comes to mics, I, I love hearing what people have, and and Harlan Hogan hasn't come up that much before, so that's why it's not, that's a that's an interesting one. It's not one you yeah. hear with the Yetis, and everybody's got Yetis and this, and that's usually yeah. the starter mic for most. It's get a Yeti, get get a, a Snowball. Those are the the quick, easy mics, and they're under a hundred bucks or or under two hundred, depending on which Yeti you have, because they have that Pro Yeti, which is pretty good too. And then as you start going, that's what we did originally years ago. And then we started buying more mics and more mics. And, and you know, our average mic now is about probably $400. And, and it's funny. You don't have to spend thousands to get good audio. If you have a good preamp or a good whatever, you can get good audio on even a really cheap mic, uh, like, a, like a $70 or $60 Shure SM58. You can still get darn good audio with that. And people go, but that's so cheap. Yeah, but it's a really good mic. So it's fun. It's fun. I love audio. The yeah, cool thing I, about the Harlan Hogan, it was that it was developed specifically for voiceovers. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it was designed with us in mind, which really drew me to, towards it initially. And again, it's it's really compact. It's not too big. You can put it on a desk with a nice screen around it, and you get such good quality out of it for such a small, easy to use mic. So I definitely would recommend that. If you're looking for the next step above the Yeti, that's a really easy next step. No, that's true. Now this is a, a learning show, so we're gonna test Rebecca right now. <laughs> <laughs> totally impromptu, nothing planned. Pop but quiz. No, I didn't know she liked audio, so 
<laughs> okay, can you tell what mic I have right now? You were in radio. This I is do a, not recognize this microphone. It's a very famous radio mic. It goes back about 50 years, and they're still making them brand new. Uh, used to oh, be wow. about a $1,500 mic. Now it's about $950. Um, it's a Sennheiser MKH416. This was one what of the most... What do you love about it? Um, very good audio reproduction. Doesn't really color your voice too much. Yet you can get close like I am, and you're not really getting that proximity effect where it's too bassy. Um, mm -hmm. It's just a good mic. It's it's one of the best. I don't know if I take this off. What it looks like. Oh, I recognize it now. Yeah, I've seen I've seen a lot of people use that. Yeah, it's a very very popular mic. Um, not to make too much this back on, but it comes off easier than it goes on. There we go. Um, so those are you know some of the mics. Uh, we have some other ones here, I think. Oh, I've got some small ones. Ah, here. You like blue? This is the yes. blue. This is the baby bottle. So <laughs> this is the, the blue baby bottle. It has a really good sound, about 400 bucks, 450 bucks. And has a nice bassy sound. It's got bass roll off, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, I think we got a really good deal on our Harlan Hogan. I think that ended up being two hundred or slightly over two hundred when we found it. That's not a bad price, yeah, and that's yeah, a good price see? for so it. So it doesn't have to be crazy expensive. Mm -mm. It doesn't have to be the nicest microphone. Obviously, your microphone is very nice for live scenarios too, because you don't want a lot of feedback, and there's no. not a, that much opportunity for post production. But if you have time for a little bit of post then yeah. there's nothing wrong with a $200 microphone. Oh, not you know? at all. So. Not at all. We have one called the, the Studio Concepts C1, Studio Projects C1. C mm -hmm. as in Charlie 1. It's a $200 mic or $250, <laughs> and it sounds exactly like a Neumann U87, I think, which is a $3,000 microphone. And we can fool. We have fooled radio engineers with it. They go, you got a Neumann? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it nothing <laughs> doesn't even look like it, but it's a great mic for 250 bucks. Go figure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's amazing. And if you get a good amplifier, it doesn't matter what mic you put, they all sound good. Yeah. So, so Rick, are you taking any of these microphones on the road to maybe Learning Solutions? Are you going to do any shows on the road? Um, I've got to talk to the new owners, the, the Brits, and talk about that. We talked briefly at the show, but it was really hard to get a hold of anybody there. But Leslie Price is good friends with them, so we'll be talking... I know originally with Dave Kelly, we talked about doing uh, a show at DevLearn this year. Learning Solutions, we're not going to this year, but DevLearn, we were planning on it. And we're planning on probably having a space area where we can do interviews right on the fly and just have the mic open even so people can do their own shows. We'll have a little bit of fun with it. That's great. Oh, well, well, too bad that we're going to miss you at Learning Solutions this year, but uh, yeah, perhaps we'll see you at because we just, we just spent a fortune going to London, so we said, okay, that, that killed Learning Solutions for us. But... Um, yeah. It gets expensive going to London. We didn't realize how much the trips, the flights are expensive. <clears throat> and we didn't even get business. It was just strictly, oh, what do they call it, coach premium. There were two guys next to us in line. They were Brits. And they said, well, I'm in rat class and you're in rat class with cheese. It's like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> they were funny. But um, it was okay. But it was, it was expensive just for the trip for, for one person. In fact, business. If we had wanted business, usually we get upgrades and it's not expensive. But on British Airways, business was 4,000 round trip per person. Oh, and wow. We went, Ooh. Ooh. First was nine, <laughs> first 9,000. And we went, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> Two people, 18 grand. <laughs> 18 grand to go to England. Can you believe it? That's a lot of money. But, and we did fly on that big plane, the Airbus 380, which is two full stories. That was sort of weird. Um, the plane holds that, 500 awesome. to 700 people, depending on how they configure it. I think we were at 500. So many people. It's enormous. Now, we're on the second, we were on the second floor, and you didn't really think that there was a floor underneath you. It's totally self-enclosed, except for a big staircase, I think, at the front, but we didn't see that. Um, it's enormous. It's just, wow. And I think that's why they don't hydrate too much, because if you had to put <laughs> that much water or drink on, it's too heavy. <laughs> Right, <laughs> And I mean, that's why we took advantage of a lot of local things. Just thinking about those price tags, you know, we mm -hmm. looked into, we were in a really great area in Tampa nearby Orlando. Yeah. And I think that's why when Learning Solutions came, we jumped on that opportunity to be a part of that community. Yep. And I know Lisa actually was part of a really exciting opportunity and was able to, well, she can tell you, I'll let her tell you. <laughs> 
Uh, oh, so you're probably talking about how we, at Learning Solutions, we picked up an award while we were there. And it's actually for the trailers we were talking about a few minutes ago. Oh, great. Yeah, that, I could see that. Are you talking about Rebecca? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, this is what I was... Yeah, yeah. So, so Mike Anderson's up on stage there because he created um, another trailer that we didn't show you earlier. Um, and it was really top notch, absolutely beautiful. It also went along with its, you know, counterpart e-learning course. So the combination um, won at that uh, event. And we found that talking to people, a lot of people said, oh, that's so interesting. You know, why aren't we making trailers also? Of course, that's mm -hmm. the way that human beings are consuming content now when they're not sure. sure, like just like when you go to Netflix, um, when you're not sure about a mm -hmm. new series that, you know, that you want to get into, if you want to start binge watching it or not, um, you watch the trailer and you get excited about it. So um, that, that um, went over really well. And uh, very, that's very clever. <clears throat> it's actually very clever because you're right. What a, what a better, what better way to draw someone into something? Yeah, and, and it's and something we're all to used to that we, we see in our daily life. When you yeah. log into Facebook, we're bombarded by, you know, these trailers and that lets you decide, you know, I want to be invested in this or this video coming up. And I feel like that just is an intuitive way to communicate with adult learners now. Just go with what they already invest their time in. What are they already excited about? Mm -hmm. And trailers is a really great way to do that. Yeah, so simple, so clever. Nobody does it, right? So you guys mm -hmm. are brilliant. And, and we're also trying to look at, you know, behavior that's not being addressed yet, it, or maybe it's being addressed in other ways, but we're not doing it yet in our learning space. So, for example, back to that idea of um, that we have these different mountains, you know, we have a mountain of needs and a mountain of solutions, um, and the only bridge between the two is a search bar. And because we have such a mountain of resources, it's very much like, um, you know, a Google search. When you search for something on Google, you end up with pages and pages of results, uh, you know, and if what you need is on, you know, page seven, you know, 10 results deep on the page, most likely people aren't going to see that because we're watching the human behavior where the masses, most of them don't make it to page two. Uh, and instead, what they do, uh, the behavior we're observing is they turn to a coworker and they say, Rick, you get me. You know who I am. You know my job. You know what I'm trying to get better at. Um, what do you think I should do? You work in the learning department. Uh, the problem is, is when you work in a learning department where you have 3,000 custom learning opportunities on top mm -hmm. of everything else you do, whether it's Good Abstract, Safari, Harvard Mentor Manager, the list goes on of all the different kinds of resources um, that are being offered you too have to go to the search bar because how could you possibly memorize all of those sure. learning opportunities? But uh, artificial intelligence won't forget. So we're playing around with this idea that an artificial intelligence chatbot could have this conversation with you. It already knows a lot about you, perhaps <clears throat> because we have it tied to HIRS systems and all sorts of things that we know about you. Mm -hmm. um, and and it can say, you know, you know hey, Rebecca, um, you know, it, you know, thanks for uh, coming over to chat. You know, what are you looking for these days? And then Rebecca can say, you know, specifically what she's looking for. The chatbot can ask some questions and then theoretically, you know, can put all that information together and dish up, you know, the top one or three results of what, you know, people should be looking at next. And then perhaps once they click on it, now they can watch the trailer to do a double check to make sure it's good. And um, now we're providing a better user experience. No, and Lisa, <laughs> when we were talking about it previously, she had mentioned something really cool about that as well. If a user goes in and says, you know, I don't really know what I'm looking for, and they type, I don't know, into the box, the chatbot can actually lead them into some trailers and say, well, here's what's trending now, and here's what we're really excited about. And here are some, you know, introductions to our company and, and where we're going. And that can kind of lead them down the right path and inspire them to interact with the chatbot more and seek the chatbot out to find more topics they're interested in interested in after they viewed that introductory content. So I definitely think, you know, sky's the limit with that chatbot experience. It could be a lot of fun. And you know what? Add some humor to the chatbot if you can. Because mm -hmm. then you might have even a better experience as people kind of get friendly and joke around with the chatbot. That could be interesting. Yeah, and, and we're in the, yeah. that phase where we're trying to think if we were going to name the chatbot, what would be the perfect name? How can we humanize this experience as much as possible so that yeah. you're not just dishing up, here's the robot 
that you can interact with. But, you know, if you're craving that human interaction, how can we make this feel a little bit more Yeah, human? and they are creating chatbots in banks and financial institutions and other customer service type situations where they have names and they they even have personalities written up on their pages. They have web pages for the chatbot. So you could say, you know, who's the chatbot? Um, and and they're pretty good. They're pretty deep. They even have custom voices for them where they're not quite the standard voice, but they may have a twang. They may have a southern accent. They may have a different accent. And it's interesting because they're going after who the population is that they service. Um, but I could think of some you know things that you could do. I mean, humor would be interesting. Um, having the mm -hmm. chatbot come up with something totally, totally unexpected. You know, within the realm I of would, reason, but something different yeah, that course. makes a person think. Wait a minute. I was talking to, I think, a chatbot recently via email. I, I put support in for a project management company that, that we use. And, and I'm talking, and all of a sudden I go, wait a minute. I don't think this is a human. <laughs> it just dawned on me. I went, mm -hmm. something's not right. And, and on the second day, when I went back to it for a follow-up question, there seemed to be no recollection of our previous conversation or at least not much mm -hmm. and i really started thinking pretty darn good chatbot because it was writing correctly but when you asked the question that was a little off and then i started getting a little creative on the question the answers got weird and i went okay i don't think it's real uh, but it was <laughs> it, it got pretty far if i hadn't pursued it a little more it would have been interesting to see where where it, it if it would have just ended i would have felt okay that was good but once I started kind of pushing at what it could do, I think I was right. It, was, it wasn't a human. And that was and that's so fun. true. Humor is yeah. such a human mm -hmm. way of communicating. And if yeah. you can add that, even, you know, we, we say, you know, we say, um, we say, hmm. Right. Adding little <laughs> nuances like that to your chatbot mm -hmm. can make it seem indistinguishable with just chatting very quickly with a human operator. And more and more so you hear people say, I don't want to talk to the robot on the phone. I don't want to talk to, you know, the chatbot. But now they are starting to gravitate towards that because they seem so human and they're mm -hmm. trying to make them sound less robotic <laughs> yes. and, and more conversational. <laughs> yep. And I, yeah. I totally agree with you. Humor is such a great way, an easy way to do that. I'll, I'll never forget one time, this is over 20 years ago. It was the weird, maybe about 20 years ago. It was the weirdest thing. It was Deutsche Bank, which is one of the world's biggest banks. And one of the guys comes in and goes, hey, Rick, you gotta hear this. This is hilarious. And I was like, all right. So we, we run through the IVR. Welcome to Deutsche Bank. If you'd like information on your accounts, press 1. If you'd like information on credit cards, press 2. And it went on to it, number 9, which was, if you'd like to hear a duck quack, press 9. <laughs> so, of course, being me, I, I hit 9. Quack! <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <laughs> it was, and, and I swear they must have gotten millions of phone calls just to hear that duck quack. It was absolutely hilarious. And for Germans, of all people, to do that, they tend to be very serious. Uh, they're very proper, and we will not have any humor in this message. No, a duck quack. How they even got away with that was, I mean, that was just too funny. But so, yeah, big companies can have a lot of fun with things if they really want, if they're not afraid of lawyers. You know, we always when we work with clients, half the time we go, oh, no, they've just gotten lawyered up. Now we can't say this. Now we can't say that. And they really get extreme on what you're allowed to and not say. And it's a shame because they're losing opportunities to train people and just have a better experience on the whole. But, and be but more it, memorable, too, because yeah. we had recently said, I think Lisa had mentioned that we end up with these mountains of information. Mm -hmm. How do you make something really stand out? How do you make something super memorable so that <laughs> they can walk away, even go to their friends who need that information and say, you got to hear this duck quack. And now they're aware of that yeah. brand. Now they're yeah. aware of this service. Nev I'll and never it forget, all started yeah. with a duck, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. How, when it's, you... it's all about finding that way to be really unique and really stand out. And yeah, and they'll again, remember it's that. such an easy way to do that. Yeah, they'll remember that. I still remember Deutsche Bank from that quack. It's like before that, I knew mm -hmm. who Deutsche Bank was, but didn't care. Now it's a Deutsche Bank quack. Yeah, that's true. I remember that. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> maybe it's not always good, but, um, but, but you're right. Retention is everything. You could even have something like um, when, they, when they get into um, a chatbot, say something like, hello, hello, Rebecca. Welcome back to the chatbot. Do you want to hear what's on sale today? Uh, okay. And then they could tell you what courses are popular that week. 
you know, do something like that. You know, little things that just make you feel like, oh, that was kind of cool. They just talked to me about something that was kind of interesting. Um, even more so if you can remember things that people ask that's another one so as you come back in they say rebecca last time you took that course did you enjoy it yeah uh, you're and then you can even actually get the feedback you want out of that because yes another thing we were looking into is a more engaging way other than just surveying after a course how to get real audience feedback did you mm -hmm. enjoy it but did <laughs> yes. you also more importantly learn anything mm -hmm. do you remember the content and so having that chatbot say, hey, did you enjoy that experience? After that chatbot made that connection with you and there's that point of kind of anonymous trust, you can, you can leave a message with the chatbot and it will take the data and it's not you responding directly to the content creators. It, it allows you to get that feedback in a really creative way. Yeah, and because of, of the database backend to some of these, you can really store a lot of feedback that you get. So for example, again, it could say Lisa, Last time you took that course, you said lesson three was really good. Have you tried lesson one in this course? It's very similar. Something mm -hmm. like that. But it could recommend things. You could create all those chains to, to really build on that tree of information that it can give you personally. And the more personalized it is, the more you think it's real. You know, they've done studies that people actually get emotionally attached to the chatbots or to other things that are more AI based when they think they're real, even games or host or something, they get more mm -hmm. emotionally attached. And if something, if all of a sudden that chatbot or host goes away, they're going, oh, I'm sad. What happened? Yeah. And that relationship building is, is actually really good. Mm -hmm. I think that that helps with that memory. You know, it's funny, Rick, I, I was listening to Margie Meacham at a, mm -hmm. a conference um, at, I think it was a TLDC. Body. Um, she was talking talking about chatbots and she was talking about how a chatbot was used in the HR space to help uh, coach employees, uh, uh, you know, how to get through certain kinds of issues. Sure. And there was uh, an uh, award program internally to recognize HR professionals. Hmm. And when um, this chatbot was being used, it was being used in such a way where um, they did not know that it was you know, a, a artificial intelligence mm -hmm. chatbot. You know, they thought they were just on the company's chat site talking with an HR professional. And so the chatbot was nominated for this HR award for phenomenal That's internal funny. customer service <laughs> and um, leadership had to come back and say oh that's so nice that's so wonderful that you wanted to nominate i forget what they called her sarah somebody um you know but sarah's not eligible for this award because she's not that's human funny. and at that point <laughs> and, and at that point 50 people in hr started looking for work so it's kind of scary <laughs> but <laughs> anyway or, well, we've, or, we've, or it empowered them to scale that's right yep <laughs> Well, we've been going on longer than normal. We've been having a really good conversation with you two. And um, I guess we better call it a show. We'd love to have both of you back on again another time. Well, Leslie, you, you, Leslie I keep calling you Leslie today. Lisa, Lisa, <laughs> um, you know you're always welcome back on. And, and half the time we call you, you're busy. So we, we know, but you're always <laughs> welcome. And Rebecca, we look forward to hear, hearing more with. from you and, and finding out more about what you do. It sounds like you do a lot oh, of fun definitely. things. Thank so, you so much for having us. This is oh, great. I totally appreciate you guys coming on. And um, if you like what you see, we'll put their information below so you can contact um, both Lisa and Rebecca and get more information on what they do. And uh, we will see you next week on eLearn Chat. Have a good one, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Rick. Thanks. Bye, bye. bye.